Happy Sunday, all you mentees! Uncanny Omar here, and today join me for an advanced look at the most recent printing of the Excalibur Omnibus Volume 1 from Marvel Comics. So, let's get started. And welcome back, everybody. Before getting started, a huge thank you to David Gabriel and the folks in Marvel for sending us an advanced copy of this book. Now, this is the part where I usually say, hey, this book is due out in the direct market and book market on such and such date. Right now, I don't know. And what's interesting is that PRH also doesn't know, and neither does Diamond. It should be out this coming week, or it could be out next week. The reason I'm doing this is to bring attention to the people that want the book and missed out on it the first time. So uh, check with your local comic book shop or online with places like CheapGraphicNovels.com, Walt's Comic Shop, InStock Trades, Organic Price Books, Dying Breed Collectors, whoever it is that you get your books from, shoot them a message and say, hey, do you happen to have this book in stock? I hate for anybody to miss out on it, and because it is a reprint, this will have a smaller print run than the first printing. But here it is, Excalibur Omnibus, Volume 1, reprinted. What you're looking at here is the direct market cover. And I'm going to be comparing it to my original printing here on the left-hand side. This is the standard edition cover. So there's also a difference in... The spines. In the standard edition, you get the Captain Britain picture down there in his new costume. And then in the direct market cover, you get this fine looking picture of Megan. Now in the back is identical. You have the pictures of all the comics collected inside of the book. ISBN at the bottom right hand side and what's collected in the book over here on the left hand side. Font looks identical. Uh... Everything else looks the same. Let's look at it underneath the dust jacket, like I normally like to show if I have the first printing of the books. So it's this beautiful image from the graphic novel, The Sword is Drawn. I'm just looking. No difference at all, really, in the colors or anything. And I'm going to be, like I said, doing a comparison here in a little bit. Um... One thing I did want to do was put the books together like this to look at the spines. And it looks like the new printing looks a little bit thicker than this printing here in the first printing. Now, both of the books were printed at the Donley printer, the original printing and the new printing. But like I said, the new printing feels, I don't know, it looks like the spine is a, just a, from this angle that I'm looking at it, uh, feels just a little bit bigger than the spine in the first printing. But regardless, let's go ahead and get this book opened, look at the artwork, talk about some of the stories without going into too many spoilers, and of course talk about where this takes place in the reading order of X-Men. Then I'll be doing a small comparison here in a little bit. All right, let's get this book opened. We have this red-orange end paper right there. This image from, I believe that's Ron Lim. Uh, on the left-hand side are all your creators, your writers, pencilers, inkers, colorists, letterers, assistant editors, and editors. Uh, credit to the cover artist, uh, the collected edition crew down here, and the table of contents. When each of these books were published, the page number you're going to find them in uh, down here is always the printing. So just in case, like I've mentioned before, this right here, for example, was printed on 124.22. So January 24th, 22, in case you're wondering where you could get the latest printing if the books are open to see if you're getting the latest printing or the original printing. So kicking it off with the Excalibur graphic novel, the special edition number one. This also contains Excalibur 1 through 34. Yeah, so pretty much you're getting the entirety of Chris Claremont's run in here. Mojo Mayhem, Quasar number 11, Thor 427 to 429. And then, of course, material from Marvel Comics Presents 51 through 58. So in here, you're going to have the works of not just Chris Claremont and Alan Davis, but also Terry Austin, um, Michael Higgins, Mark Grunewald, Tom DeFalco, Scott Lobdell, Ron Lim, Marshall Rogers, Chris Wozniak, just to name a few. Now, I can't remember how I did my overview of the first printing, uh, the first printing came out in, I believe it was December of 2021. But just in case, I don't go back and watch my videos, unless I'm editing them, of course. Uh, but that's before I make them go live. So 
I may be repeating myself, and I apologize for that in case you watch all my videos and you're like, man, this guy sounds like a broken record. I'm sure I do to some people anyway. So really quickly, I do have to mention a quick spoiler, because in order to talk about when this book takes place and why it takes place, I have to mention something called the Fall of the Mutants and what happens in the pages of Fall of the Mutants that causes this book to happen. All right, you ready for the spoilers of Fall of the Mutants? And it's probably not a big spoiler to anybody, but just in case. All right, here's a spoiler to Fall of the Mutants. The X-Men are dead at the end of that story. Now, of course, are they really dead? Well, you can go and read Fall of the Mutants to find out, and then you can go read the Inferno prologue. But as far as the characters that were in the X-Men, like Nightcrawler and Kitty Pride and Rachel Summers, Phoenix, and of course, um, Captain Britain, Brian Braddock, his sister Betsy was part of the X-Men at the time, they are dead. That's why everybody is mourning at the very beginning. Kitty's having nightmares of being, be, being dragged with the X-Men, but it turns out to be the Warwolves. And Rachel appears in her dream. Nightcrawler's having a problem dealing with their deaths. Captain Britain is drinking and crying because he lost his sister. Megan doesn't know what to do. So she reaches out to these X-Men that are staying at the time on Muir Island. So, of course, comes Gatecrasher and the characters of TechNet to invade their personal space. And then we see the return of Saturn 9 right there. So you do see a lot of returning characters if you've been reading the pages of Captain Britain. It sets up a lot of the characters, not just Gatecrasher and TechNet and Saturn 9, but also characters like the Crazy Gang and Kurt, uh, Courtney Ross. And you see a lot of that Captain Britain lore brought over here, especially when we get to the cross-time caper. But this one-shot, this original graphic novel, sets up this new team. So like I mentioned, they think the X-Men are dead. So by the end of this, they have a dream they want to follow. A mix of Professor... Okay, I'm going to talk pretty one day. Professor Xavier's dreams mixed in with a blend of the UK dream. And here we have the sword is drawn Excalibur. Now, because of the success of that, they did start on their own monthly series about a year later in 1988. And it kicks off with right here, Excalibur number one, because you demanded it. I love it. I love that I get to say that too now when I talk about reprints, because you demanded it. Classic. In their own monthly title series. And you have the War Wolves down here. And in this particular issue, uh, we're introduced to this little character known as Widget. And Widget plays a big part later on. Uh, now the colors look a lot different, of course, because the colors in here were for that graphic novel. Now the colors are a lot more vibrant and beautiful. And that is something that I really enjoyed about both the first printing and this, are just how beautiful uh, the restored artwork is in all of, all of this collection. With one exception, and I'll get there in a second. Uh, here's Kai Loon. I'm sorry, Colin. You'll see him come back when Alan Davis comes back to the book. So Alan Davis does end up leaving the book. Chris Claremont ends up leaving the book as of issue 34. And then we have a bunch of fill-ins up until Alan Davis returns with issue 42. So in the back of each of the issues for the first... Oh my goodness, they did it for about 15, 16 something issues like that. You do have a pin-up in the back of an issue. So this is like the back of issue number three. I've always loved that cover. The covers are so, uh, they're, they're like fourth wall breaking. I love them. There are some things in this book that really surprise me. Like, I think much like the case of JLI, Justice League International, when a lot of people hear of Excalibur or Justice League International, they immediately think, oh, that's just a funny book. It's funny because that's what we used to call comics back in the day. That's just a book that's just humorous. It's not to be taken seriously. But if you're not reading it because of that, you are missing out on some damn good stories. It's a lot of heart in these stories, both this and JLI. But let's focus back on this. You know, whenever I heard my friends talk about that, because you have to think, like, Excalibur at the time was very, very few of us that were, that were reading Excalibur. Not a lot of people were talking about Excalibur. This is the return of the Crazy Gang and Arcade who, again, showed up in Captain Britain. But not a lot of people were talking about these books. Most people were talking about, of course, X-Men, uh, New Mutants, and X-Factor. And I'm sure this was, like, the bastard child of all the X titles for the longest time. But it lasted 125 issues. 
So some of us were buying it. But yeah, not everybody. All the cool kids wanted just X-Men. Nobody cared about Excalibur. And to an extent, I mean, I both enjoyed that and didn't like that. Yes, the characters in this book think the X-Men are dead, so it makes sense for them to be in their own little corner of the universe. Even during the Inferno crossover right here, which, by the way, issue 7. Oh, I love that spread page cover. I'll, I'll show it here in a little bit. But even during that event... We don't have um, them running into the X-Men here, actually. Yes, right here. I've always been a fan of this. Uh, Paul Neary supplying the inks for a while, uh, towards the very beginning of Alan Davis's run on Excalibur. So instead of having like a splash page on the back, it's this right here. And another thing that happened too was Excalibur for the longest time was also direct market only. You could only get it at comic book stores. I don't think it was being sold at like, like, like at the time, you know, pharmacies and grocery stores were carrying comics. I think it, later on they changed it. It was a little more expensive than X-Men as well as far as like the price. But I love those issues. This is the Ron Lim fill-in issue right here. This kind of showcases like Megan's struggle and power. Like, whenever she's around somebody, you know. Because Megan, if you've read Captain Britain, you know that she's a shape changer. And, unfortunately, she sometimes can't control that. So, she really doesn't look like this blonde bombshell all the time. I just realized I pointed at Captain Britain. I promise I was talking about Megan as a blonde bombshell. Uh, you know, it depends on who she's around sometimes. So, there's that struggle with that particular character. And then you have Rachel right here, who realizes that her existence doesn't make any sense because in this reality you have this little baby right here christopher nathan so no nathan christopher summers and you all know who he becomes later so she's struggling with the idea that it, this is not her past or this if the past has changed how can she still exist if she is the child of phoenix and scott summers and phoenix is dead in this particular universe then how can she be around so this is what I mean by this book is a lot deeper than a lot of people give it credit for. There are deaths in here that took me by surprise that I didn't think were fair. Deaths that nobody even acknowledged, none of the characters acknowledge or their supporting cast acknowledge until much later. That really surprised me. And speaking of supporting cast, we're also introduced to The Who, the Weird Happenings Organization. Yes, Chris Claremont and Alan Davis were big fans of Doctor Who. So you have Alice Dane and Alistair Stewart that are part of that. And they become a huge part of the supporting cast. And Widget. Remember when I said the little character that appeared in issue number one? Well, he is the whole reason for or the cross-time caper. Which takes our characters... Oh, before we get there, though, we got to look at some of this mojo mayhem. Arthur Adams artwork and inks by... I think it's Bob Wyzak, if I'm not mistaken. But here we go. The Cross Time Caper. The story that was only supposed to take nine issues, but I think it lasted 13, 14 issues with some fill-in artists. I, I had a point. I can't even remember. Oh, yeah. The widget is the reason why they're going through this. Multiple Earths. So, Excalibur. The characters of Excalibur were hopping around different realities in the Marvel Universe long before there were the Exiles. Long before it became the cool thing to do. And of course, long before this was Alan Moore's run on Captain Britain, which kind of set the bar for reality hopping and introduced us, of course, to the 616 universe. So this particular story, like I mentioned, was supposed to last nine issues, uh, but it lasted way longer than that. I've always been a fan of this cover. And while I have this cover open, I do have to talk about this. Remember when I said I love the restoration in this, the colors pop out. They're so beautiful, with the exception of some of the grays. Not all the grays. Depending on the shade of the gray, I don't know. You see, these files, I think, were just scanned. And they've been using the same scan files. The same files were found in the Epic Collection. Uh, they're a little more cleaned up than in the classics, those trade paperbacks. But they are not like the original colors. Uh, they're just not the greatest scans as far as like the grays. I'm not sure if you can tell. There is this strange moray pattern going on. You can almost see the dots in there. And here, for example. 
Now, everything else looks great, so it makes those kind of grays stand out. And like I said, it's not every shade of gray. But that's about the only bad thing I can really say about the reproduction value of this book and the first printing. Because it can also be found in the first printing, by the way. Love the cover right here. I wish they had used this for either the spine or the back of the book. I've always been a fan of that cover. Kurt Wagner, Warlord of Question Mark. So, if you're wondering who your main characters are for the longest time, especially through the first omnibus, you're just having to deal with five core members. You have Nightcrawler, you have Catherine Kitty Pride right there. Oh, wait, Shadow Cat, sorry, I was calling Kurt Wagner by his code name. You have Rachel Summers, Phoenix, you have Megan, and you have Brian Braddock, Captain Britain. So, actually, it's in the. Uh, cross time caper that Captain Britain gets his new costume. If, I think it's in the second issue? Yeah, right here. The second part of the cross time caper. This is his new slicker look. And let's just keep going through here. Well, we talked about the content. We've seen a lot of the Alan Davis artwork. Let's look at the other artwork that's collected in here. This is uh, Chris Wozniak. And to a lot of people, uh, this they weren't his their favorite issues. I actually thought his issues stood out. They looked interesting. They looked like they were almost channeling that Arthur Adams and then what eventually Umberto Ramos would do. I know, I'm probably alone in thinking that. Uh, the book, by the way, has 1136 pages. But he's only in it for a couple of fill-in issues. Ron Limbs has a full, couple of fill-in issues. And here we have Alan Davis back again. So Alan Davis comes back off and on. The one thing I forgot to mention that's one of my favorite things in issue number 8 the Ron Lim fill-in issue after Inferno, is the confrontation between Kitty Pride and the New Mutants. She sees her friend Magic change because of the things that happen in Inferno. And then, of course, she talks about Doug. Her and Doug Ramsey were best of friends. And during this time, again, just a little bit of a spoiler, because of all the mutants, he's dead. So, so many things have changed. And then, of course, she still believes the X-Men are dead. And... I thought this was a wonderful just reunion between Kitty Pride and, you know, the New Mutants, the, the characters that she rejected because she refused to join the X-Babies. So, some more of this artwork here. Michael Higgins writing a couple of fill-in stories that later on come back in uh, the second volume of Excalibur. But I think I've gone on a lot about this. I believe in my first uh, review of this in 2020. One, when I did, uh, or no, 2020, whenever I did an overview of the first printing, this is the issue I compared it to the epics, if you want to go back and watch that video. Um, because I think I was talking about the color and the grays. See, and even in this one, the scans look the same as in the epic collection. I think some of them just have bad scans. And the book wraps up with Chris Claremont's final issues. And this is uh, drawn by Ron Wagner. And it's the... Girls' School from Heck storyline. Uh, we have the Marvel Comics Presents here, drawn by Eric Larson. And you have the Mighty Thor issues here in the back. With the Wrecking Crew and the team up with Thor. As far as the extras, you have the Marvel Age cover, which they use for the direct market cover. Right here. And the articles, the interview with Alan Davis on Excalibur, monthly series starts... I love that they collect all this stuff in here. Here's the th same picture, just a different ad, more ads. I always wonder if that was supposed to be her new costume, or if that was just a big mistake, and Megan looking a lot like Psylocke. Maybe the original idea was to, for Megan to take on those attributes of Psylocke, uh, since they believe she was dead, but then maybe they thought, oh, that's a little too morbid. Here's the official handbook of the Marvel Universe featuring the Excalibur characters. And those are the profile pictures, by the way, that they used on the spines for both Captain Britain and Megan. There's Technet, all the characters. I think I remember naming them off in one of my overviews. I love this reaction from the letter pages of Phoenix reacting to a guest artist. What do you mean now when Davis won't be drawing the next issue? This was a mistake by the artist that accidentally drew Widget instead of Captain Britain. So then he, they decided to let him just draw Captain Britain. And then not photoshopped it, photo stated the art and passed it in. And none of us knew any better. 
Here's the Chris Wozniak interview. Hello, ladies, from the swimsuit issues. The trading cards. The Knights of Pendragon, which, hey, there's getting an omnibus of that coming out. And, of course, issue 125, the final issue, which is a take on the classic graphic novel issue number one. And I hope they go all the way with this. I hope they, we get two more Omnis wrapping up the series. We get the mini series Excalibur. We get the next Excalibur by Chris Claremont. Uh, original pages and some homage covers right there. And more original pages. I think some of the trade paperback colors are back here whenever they would recolor them for the trade paperbacks. Yeah, these are the classics right here. And then the epic collections. Now, let's look at the binding compared to the first printing. The book is sewn binding, and there's what your eye looks like. Little different than the first printing, that's for sure. This is the first original printing up at the top. Now, as far as the art restoration, like I said, is the exact same printer, original printing here on the left, new printing on the right. Uh, the big difference is that it's just a little bit darker here on the right-hand side, the colors. But, of course, I had to stop at this particular story to talk about the paper quality uh, because this was I remember the anime issue that's quote unquote what it was called that's what people were selling it as the first American comic that had manga type of art it's just one of those cross time caper stories but anyway uh, as far as the paper quality because remember when I said the new printing looks a little bit thicker I think it's just the binding because paper seems identical almost I'm not an expert, I'm not a paper whisperer, but if I have to guess, yeah, the paper is identical. Both of them feel the same. So I think it's just the way that it's bound. This is the way that it opens up here with a little more gutter loss than the original printing. Again, a little color comparison. Colors are a little bit darker here in the new printing than the original printing. I'm not sure if that helps hide the scans or not. Actually, I think it does just a little bit. So if I had to redo it again i think i'd get this one of course if i had to redo it again i'd get them to uh fix the scans to begin with but hey but that as they say is that if you're interested in purchasing this book don't forget to check out our sponsors cheapgraphicnovels.com your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50 percent off cover price they have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know near mint condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with a kind of deep discount, quality shipping and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. If you live in Europe and are interested in pre-ordering or purchasing Omnis, then you should definitely check out Walt's Comic Shop in Berlin, Germany. They have the cheapest pre-order prices for Marvel and DC big books within the EU, flat shipping of 990 euro for EU countries, extremely careful and sturdy packaging, emails are answered within 24 hours, and they have a superb selection of new releases and out-of-print books on their website. Just head over to waltzcomicshop.com for more great deals and rare titles. And for a limited time, you can use the code near min condition all one word at the checkout for free shipping to all EU countries with your first order. Walt's Comic Shop, your reliable source for Omnis and premium collected editions in Europe. And that was the content and the page count and build of this omnibus. Let me know in the comments down below if you missed out on it the first time and you're excited to get your hands on it this time around. I hope you're able to. And always like to remind people that this will be a smaller print run. So just in case you want it, you know, maybe try to get it within a week or so or pre-order it if you still can. This was the Uncanny Omar. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to smash that like button. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. Ring that bell for notifications to let you know when our videos are going live. We put out a video every day. Sometimes two. Sometimes three if we get crazy. And if you have any more questions, leave your questions in the comments section. Everyone stay healthy and safe out there. Much love.